All right, so let's just quickly summarize what we know about professional skepticism. And so, as uh, the title slide, it's, a, you know, you maintain an attitude that has a question in mind, critical assessment of the evidence. And, you know, the first question I asked was, what is professional skepticism? And so all of these uh, all of the above, basically. You neither assume that management is dishonest nor assumes an unquestioned honesty. And that's identified, it says that, uh, when it talks about professional skepticism in the standards. Now, I want to make a point about that. There's no standard that's called professional skepticism, right? So you won't go and say AUXXX, and that's the standard on professional skepticism. What you'll see is professional skepticism is woven throughout the standards. So for example, if we're talking about um, uh, SAS 99, which is uh, the auditor's uh, response to fraud, risk assessment, right? That they'll talk about professional skepticism in that standard. They'll talk about professional skepticism in the risk standards. So it's woven throughout the standards. Um, it means that the auditor makes a critical assessment. The auditor has a question in mind uh, that uh, the, it's the opposite of trust. Right? And so, and this is some, you know, the, the academic um, profession has done a lot of research on professional skepticism. In fact, uh, one of my um, professors when I was at uh, Wisconsin doing my PhD did her dissertation on professional skepticism. Um, and she drew from the philosophy literature and then kind of applied that to, well, what, what does professional skepticism looks, look like? So she developed a questionnaire or survey and then based on um, how people address that survey, they were e identified as either being highly skeptical or less skeptical, and then she applied that to um, auditors. She had auditors, um, practicing auditors, fill out her survey and then address, then answer a case. Work, um, uh, and what she found was that, you know, auditors who, and, and I'm summarizing and paraphrasing, but auditors who were highly skeptical uh, were, you know, the, their judgment was more conservative, right? So they were least likely to align themselves with the client in, that, in her case. And I don't remember all of the details of the case versus those auditors who were less skeptical were more likely to kind of concede to the client in some ways. But uh, then there's this earlier research back in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, where they look at trust. And so, uh, so the trust scale has been used as a way to, to determine if somebody's, are you more trusting? Because the idea there is if you're more trusting, then you're least likely to, you know, uh, believe that the client is dishonest. Um, or accept the client, and you're, you're more likely to accept the client's explanation of things. So trust has been also used to measure professional skepticism. Um, versus if you're a person who is just distrustful by nature, you don't believe what people say anyway. So you're going to challenge them. You don't trust anything that's coming out of that person's mouth. So you're going to challenge them, right? Um, and then is the propensity of an individual to defer concluding until the evidence provides sufficient um, support for one alternative explanation or the other. And that's uh, Kathy Hurd, who is a, she's now at, um, Baylor, but she was at Wisconsin, a professor at Wisconsin when I was there. So all of these, if you look at the literature, the academic literature, research on professional skepticism, you see more or less a lot of these, these definitions woven throughout the standards to, to indicate what we mean by professional skepticism. Um, so the standards basically say that the auditor, as I said, there's no standard that says professional skepticism, but basically the auditor performs the audit with this mindset of professional skepticism. Um, that this is a discussion that should happen amongst the audit team. So for example, with SAS 99, which deals with fraud, um, it, they will say in that standard that the audit team should brainstorm. So the audit team should kind of get together and identify where is the risk of fraud. And, and given that risk of fraud in the audit, so let's say the company has lax internal controls or contr internal controls over the revenue process and it is not very effective. You as an audit team, the audit engagement team would basically conclude, uh, okay, well, then we're, this area is susceptible to fraud and here's how fraud could be perpetrated, right? Here's where it's most likely to be perpetrated. 
that doesn't mean that fraud is happening, but that means that you, as an audit team member, you're, you're aware. You're, you, you're aware of where uh, the company is susceptible to fraud, and you're going to respond through your audit approach to that um, higher risk of fraud. Doesn't mean that fraud occurred. Did you have a question, sir? OK. All right. Um, other things, uh, we talked about this, uh, professional skepticism in auditing. Uh, you want to approach the audit by, um, again, think about Will. Will, you know, he didn't allow his personal relationship with Jess to impact how he approached that audit. He approached that audit. He, when evidence came in, he critically evaluated that evidence. He made an assessment based on the evidence, not based on his, his relationship with Jess, right? He confronted, but not in a way like you, you're in the person's face, right? You ask them questions. You challenge them. You, uh, you have to maintain your, we call it professional skepticism. So you maintain your professionalism, right, when you're addressing your client. But you, you want to keep this, op this questioning mind. Um, some of the things, we, we, we kind of covered this, biases. We saw this in the case with Will, personal relationships. Yes, Jess was his friend, but we as auditors, or you as soon to be auditors, are going to have relationships with your, you, you know, just a civil relationship with your client. You could also find yourself in a situation where, you know, your manager might make a decision about something, and you, being the person who's doing the audit work, might say, mm, that doesn't seem right based on the evidence I have. Right? So, but now you're, you, are you going to challenge your manager? Are you going to challenge your senior? We'll talk more about this when we talk about ethics. But, you know, you, again, does your professional skepticism go out the window just because it's the audit manager or the audit senior? Right? So, also, those relationships, time pressures, those are the things that kind of impact your ability um, to be mindful or keep a question, have a questioning mind, but importantly, acting on those things that you find um, you know, don't seem to be right. Like the, the thing that Will, yes, was skeptical, but even bigger than that, he acted on his skepticism. He followed through. Um, I'm not going to go into these in a lot of detail, but just the, some ideas. Uh, overconfidence has been, so people just assume they kind of know it. Look, I got this. I understand internal controls. Um, so you, as a result of that, it limits your ability or impairs your approach to evaluating that evidence. Another thing is group think, right? And this is really key in auditing because we're an audit engagement team, right? And so you can easily, sometimes people are easy, especially if it's coming from a person who has more experience and expertise, and they say to you, ah, oh, that's nothing, right? And so it's easy for you to kind of go along with that because you're new are uh, less experienced than that person, and you might doubt. That person might have been on the client for the last five years. This is your first year on the client. Right? So you just kind of go along with the group. And, and it happens all the time where, where you know, managers, because they have all kinds of other engagement priorities, right? and they want you to just, let's move it along. We've got to get this signed off on. Uh, another thing is motivated reasoning. Uh, that's a common one that you see as well, is that your motive because, again, you like the client, you've been on the client a long time, the client is a good client, you don't believe that they're trying to do anything wrong. In Will's case, Jess was his wife's, I'm sorry, his best friend's wife. He knows her personally. She wouldn't do anything wrong. He could have been motivated to accept her explanations. That's what we mean by motivated reasoning. So you're motivated to accept the client's position because you have all these other incentives going on. Um, um, just in terms of professional skepticism, before we wrap up, if you look, and this, this slide's a little bit older, but this still, this still applies. I mean, I don't think it's gotten any better. Certainly based on the PCOB reviews, is that 60% um, in the, the SEC cases where they cite auditors, the auditors, the enforcement actions, um, that auditors fail to exercise due professional care in 71% of those cases and fail to maintain an attitude of professional skepticism in 60% of the cases involving 
these um, uh, audit actions. Um, the other thing is the PCLB, which is looking at publicly held companies, the audits of publicly held companies, most times that they find deficiencies, they attribute those deficiencies to a lack of professional skepticism. Um, just one quick thing that I wanted to point out before we end up. Research finds, and this is academic research, finds that auditors, audit staff, meaning you guys, when you start out, are the most willing to confront the client. Seniors are much less willing to confront the client um, unless they're in a high fraud risk situation. Manager, managers are uniformly less willing to confront, uh, and even when the risk of fraud is high, uh, partners are sensitive to fraud motivations except in situations where it's an important client. Um, and so basically what this is telling you, think about where that, so professional skepticism starts to decline as you move up the ladder. So I want you to think about what are the incentives that would lead us to get to that point. And that's kind of scary when you think that the, as you get to the level of partner that your professional skepticism is on the decline because you're the person that's absolutely responsible for signing off on that audit. So think about that.